Order. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. And I have the impression that the member for Aston has concluded his remarks. Thank the member for Aston. Um, questions without notice. Are there any questions? The member for Fraser. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer, Mr. Speaker, and I refer to the admission by the Secretary of the Finance Department in Senate estimates yesterday that the budget papers have overvalued Telstra by about $3 billion and that, as a result, the department will publish corrected figures. Was the Treasurer aware of this massive overstatement of Telstra's value when he presented the budget two weeks ago? Treasurer, isn't it the case that Section 296 of the Corporations Act says a company's financial report must comply with relevant accounting standards and that breach of this provision carries a penalty of up to five years jail or a $100,000 fine or a civil penalty of $200,000? Isn't it then the case that if the same principle of accurate disclosure was applied to the Treasurer, his failure to uh, comply with the relevant accounting standards could expose him to a potential penalty? The Treasurer. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, um, the, uh, the answer to the honourable member's question, of course, is uh, that uh, it's been fully explained by Senator Minchin in Senate estimates that in a statement of net worth <coughs> under AS31, Braden. Telstra can be valued at uh, market uh, price, at historical cost, with uh, less, absolutely, uh, with um, uh, platforms uh, can be valued at cost. Mr Speaker, that puts a value on platforms at $31.5 billion and showed a net worth under uh, AAS 31 of minus 49 uh, billion odd in 2002-2003. Uh, the government, in addition to doing net worth on a AAS 31 basis, also does it on a GFS basis. On a GFS basis, uh, Mr Speaker, the valuation of Telstra uh, would be at market value, with defence platforms valued at zero. Uh, that produces um, an estimate of net worth in 2002-2003 of minus 47 billion odd. Both of these, Mr. Speaker, of course, are huge estimations. Uh, for example, valuing the whole of Australia's defence platforms at zero—that uh, is, the Collins-class submarines, frigates, uh, F-111s, Hornets at zero. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is uh, is obviously very wide of their actual value. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, in relation to uh, much of the Commonwealth land holding, uh, that is not valued at true market uh, rent. We don't attempt to value defence land such as North Head or South Head at full market value, uh, or indeed the uh, buildings around Parliament House. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, these are very, very general estimations, uh, and they vary according to the particular values that one puts on them. Uh, Senator Minchin has released. Uh, a different valuation, a 90-day valuation in relation to GFS standard this afternoon, which does it on an additional basis, so that, Mr Speaker, it can be done on every single basis you like, AAS31, GFS, GFS on 90-day market average. But these are still estimations, Mr Speaker. The important point, the important point is that this does not affect the budget. It does not affect the cash position, it does not affect the fiscal position, it does not affect the operating position. This is a statement, Mr Speaker, in relation to net worth, which the Commonwealth has been putting in budget papers only since 1999-2000. These are very general estimates, and the government will be reporting on all of the different bases, Mr Speaker, so that they're there for the historic record, but it makes no difference whatsoever to the underlying budget position as reported in the budget on last Tuesday night uh, fortnight. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Blair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Uh, would the Prime Minister inform the House of the advice available to the government about when Australia first became a terrorist target for al-Qaeda? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the member for Blair 
for what is a very important question. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's clear that Australia has been an al-Qaeda target since at least November of 2001. We know this because on the 3rd of November 2001, Osama bin Laden first made specific reference to Australia when he criticised Australian troops in East Timor who were there under UN auspices as a, quote, crusader force. Bin Laden specifically mentioned Australia on two subsequent occasions, most recently following the Bali attacks. But a recent statement on the 21st of May by Bin Laden's spiritual mentor and deputy, Al Sawari, confirmed that Australia remains a terrorist target. But I can now inform the House, Mr Speaker, that new information has come to light very recently indicating that al-Qaeda explored possible targets in Australia in 2000 or 2001. These reports indicate that al-Qaeda's interest in mounting attacks in Australia actually predated the 11th of September 2001 attacks in New York and Washington. Al-Qaeda's targeting of Australia does not derive from our military involvement in Afghanistan or Iraq. Rather, al-Qaeda's interest in attacking Australia derives from the fact that we are a Western nation with Western values that are abhorrent to the militant theology which is at the heart of al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has a transparent self-interest in trying to attract support for its terrorist cause by seeking to present its inhumane attacks as a response to specific events such as East Timor, Afghanistan and Iraq. This new information, Mr Speaker, of course, relates to past planning and past events. And I want to reassure the House that it has not resulted in a change to current threat levels either in Australia or for Australian interests abroad. No specific or other intelligence has been received indicating any current plan for an attack in Australia by al-Qaeda or any other group that might warrant a change in the assessed terrorist threat level within our country. The government remains committed to do everything possible to protect the safety of Australians from terrorism. And if any more information were to come to light which caused the government to change the assessed terrorism threat to Australia, the public will be advised without delay. Mr Speaker, finally, can I inform the House that at my request the Leader of the Opposition was specifically briefed on this new information on 26 May by the Director-General of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. Yeah, yeah. for Fraser. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Isn't it the case that whatever measure is used, GFS market value, AAS 31, None of these valuations would justify the $3 billion increase in Tel Telstra's value shown in your budget. Treasurer? Uh, no, it's not the case, because as I've just explained, under AAAS 31, mm. Telstra is valued at historic costs. So it's not the case at all. Mr Speaker, as I've previously, uh, as I've previously uh, indicated, uh, Mr Speaker, the statement of net worth does not affect the budget year, the underlying cash surplus, the headline cash surplus, the operating statement, the fiscal surplus uh, or any of those other matters. It is a, an attempt, Mr Speaker, to try and get to the net worth of the Commonwealth, which the Commonwealth has variously estimated under different measures could be a negative $46 billion or negative $50 billion, depending on the kind of price that you want to put on defence platforms. Uh, but I will say this, Mr Speaker, it is true, it is absolutely true that the value of the, I think it's six and a half billion shares that the Commonwealth holds in Telstra have declined. Absolutely true. Mr Speaker, if the Senate had passed the government's legislation and the government had sold those at the time of T2, yeah. The Commonwealth would have received around about $29 billion more than they are worth today. That was, that was a really good decision. So 
I don't know what point the Australian Labor Party is trying to make here. It is true that the Australian Labor Party. Well, no, the Treasurer has the call. This much is true that the Australian Tra Labor Party, by its efforts in defeating the authorisation for the government to put uh, equity of Telstra on the market, Member for has Fraser. presided over a $29 billion dollar loss in net worth. Mr. Speaker. So, I don't know if the Australian Labor Party considers that a great success. The government has, in fact, marked down its valuation of Telstra shares, and, Mr. Speaker, that is the uh, that is the effect of having those $6.5 billion shares at the kind of market prices that now prevail, rather than the prices that prevailed at the time of T2. Honourable Member for Sturt. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer advise the House of the results of the capital expenditure publication released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics this morning? What is the outlook for business investment in Australia? Treasurer. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Sturt for his question, uh, and I can inform the House that uh, total new capital expenditure in the March quarter, whilst showing a 5.3 per cent decline, showed that over the course of the year, Capital expenditure had risen by 18.2 per cent. Now, Mr. Speaker, the reason for the decline in the March quarter is it was coming off uh, an artificially high December quarter, which had increased by 13.7 per cent, led particularly by the importation by Qantas of civil aircraft of around $1.7 billion. So, Mr. Speaker, you had an abnormally high build-up in the December quarter. You have a correction in March. Once you take those lumpy figures out, over the course of the year, capital expenditure rose by 18.2 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, in addition to that, we had released today the sixth estimate for capital spending in 2002-03, which was 16.7 per cent stronger than the equivalent estimate for 2001-2002. So, Mr Speaker, again, the intention for the whole of this year is a very large rise on the outcome for the previous year. What this shows, Mr Speaker, is there is very strong capital expenditure going on in the Australian economy. Uh, in part, Mr Speaker, this is reflected uh, in today's trade figures, uh, which shows that uh, imports were up, uh, being much higher in April uh, than previous month. Uh, whilst exports were down. No doubt the Trade Minister will have something to say about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but the uh, international trade on goods and services for the month of April, which were already released today, shows Mr. Speaker, a story of a strong domestic Australian economy, notwithstanding a very weak international economy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, in addition, of course, drought affects uh, some of Australia's exports, particularly in the rural area. But if we come back to capital expenditure, Mr Speaker, as I was saying yesterday, confirming the construction work done figures, uh, capital expenditure has been very strong in the course of this year, uh, both in construction uh, and in equipment. Uh, this is continuing to drive a strong underlying Australian economy. It is supported by low interest rates. It is, in addition, supported by the fact that the government has taken taxes off inputs and, as I said yesterday, in the residential sector, supported by a strong first home owners scheme, which has given young Australians a chance to get uh, a home. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Sturt for his question, uh, and I can inform him that today's figures confirm strong underlying capital expenditure going on in the Australian economy. The honourable member for Rankin. My question is to the Minister for Trade. Can the minister confirm that today's $3.1 billion trade deficit is the worst in Australia's history, is the 17th trade deficit in a row, makes a deficit of $17 billion over the last 12 months, is the worst 12-month export slump in our history, and will add to Australia's record current account deficit and record $350 billion foreign debt? How does the minister explain the 60 per cent slump in the growth of our exports of high-valued manufactured goods and the grim reality that Australia is losing market share in our major export markets? Does the minister stand by his statement that Australia's trade deficits are no cause for concern? 
The Minister for Trade. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think the uh, the honourable member for Order. his question and, uh, has the call. from the from the outset, uh, I also should, also should uh, indicate to the House that um, uh, when we came to office in 1996, there were 99 billion dollars worth of exports of goods and services, and that's increased by 50 per cent over those years we've been in office to 150, 151 call. billion dollars worth Order. of exports of goods and services out of Australia, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And if the Australian Labor Party had their way. Uh, we wouldn't have achieved those targets because we wouldn't have been able to reform the economy and make it efficient and, and uh, competitive the way we have. But, Mr. Speaker, um, today uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, announced the, or released the, uh, the trade figures for, for April, and those trade figures indicate, and as the Treasurer has indicated, uh, it's a result of a, very, of a very strong domestic economy and a very weak global economy, uh, a very strong domestic the economy Rankin. and a very weak international economy. The, uh, the increase in, uh, in imports reflects the strength of the Australian economy, and I don't think that's disputed at all. Uh, but uh, also, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our exports have been hit by a triple whammy of SARS, drought, and a sluggish world economy. Uh, there's no question about that. And these factors, these factors, uh, yeah. And then we can add the Labor Party. We'll, we'll make it a quadruple whammy. The Labor Party as well, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Minister and, uh, Mitchell, yeah, it's, it, it, but, Mr. Speaker, these factors have combined. They have combined to uh, to deliver a trade deficit of 3.1 billion dollars, and and certainly and certainly not good news. And nobody's saying it's good news. But, but, Mr. Speaker, there are good reasons, and we need to be realistic about these reasons. There are good reasons for it, and I've outlined that in terms of the exports, the impact on exports. Uh, we're just starting to realise the impact of SARS throughout the region, where there've been where there've been the SARS throughout the Batman. region has had. A dramatic impact not just on the tourism industry and visitation to Australia. Seasonally adjusted short-term visitation arrivals for April were the lowest for five years. Remember, remember that tourism is our largest export earner. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, some merchandise exports into, uh, into the East Asian region have also declined as a result of the impact of SARS and, lo and lo lowering economic activity in the region. And of course, the Labor Party won't recognise the impact of drought. The drought, with, the drought is still with us in Australia. The drought is still with us. It has rained in some parts of Australia. It has rained in some parts of Australia, but the drought is still affecting our export effort as far as uh, the, uh, the rural economy is concerned. And of course, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the sluggish global economy is having a dramatic impact uh, on our markets. Continuing poor performance of our major trading partners has continued. Uh, to, uh, to fall in non and so our, uh, has contributed to a fall in our non-rural and other goods. And Australia is not alone, Mr. Speaker. Australia is not alone in facing a difficult export environment. Exports from our regional, other regional economies have also been negatively affected. Countries like New Zealand, Singapore, and Thailand. But despite the tough times that we are facing, Australia's robust economic fundamentals mean that we are well placed to meet these challenges. We've got to be prepared to meet these challenges, and I've been saying uh, for the last couple of months that this year, this year in the international exporting environment, is is going to be competitive and it's going to be tough, and we need to meet those challenges. But, Mr. Speaker, we are able to do that because we've got an economy that has a budget in surplus. We've got an economy that's delivered low unemployment, low interest rates, low inflation, and low public sector debt. That means our economy is performing strongly, and that that is reflected in these statistics today. And while our strong economy obviously impacts on our uh, trade performance, this government is not about to pursue the types of policies that we've seen from previous Labor governments in similar circumstances, which killed off both import and export growth and which led to unemployment of over 10 per cent and the highest interest rates this country ever, ever suffered. Member for Wills on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 321, I ask that the minister table the document from which he was quoting. <coughs> Was the minister quoting from a document? My first question is: Was the member for Wells resume his seat? The member, the minister, standing orders provide that I ask the minister two questions. Was the minister quoting from a document? Was the document confidential? The minister has indicated the document is confidential. Member for Kuryong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the minister for foreign affairs. Would the Minister, Minister for Kuyong might care to resume his seat? 
I'm reminded of the point of order raised by the member for Lilly yesterday. During the last answer, there were 15 interjections from my left-hand side. Member for Kuyong. Thank you again, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Would the minister update the House on recent revelations regarding gross human rights abuse by Saddam Hussein's regime, including recent discoveries of mass grave sites? Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr Speaker, first can I thank the honourable member for Kuyong for his question. Um, Mr Speaker, as the House knows, the um, causes belly for action in Iraq remains as it has always been, and that is the need to eliminate the threat of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. And the release overnight of a CIA DIA report on the discovery of mobile biological weapons laboratories illustrates we're making headway. It the Leader of the Opposition, the Minister has the call. Right. Minister. Mr Speaker, the release overnight of a CIA DIA report on the discovery of mobile biological weapons laboratories illustrates that headway is being made in uncovering the full story about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction capability. And as that report notes, the findings are the strongest evidence to date that Iraq was hiding a biological warfare program. But having said that, Mr Speaker, it is also true that the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime has brought to an end one of the cruelest chapters in modern history. The true scale of its horrors is only now being revealed by a people free of intimidation and fear. And Mr Speaker, when I was in Iraq myself, I think this was uh, patently obvious. Most chilling are the numerous mass grave sites which have been unearthed by coalition forces with the help of information provided by the local Iraqi population. Recently, two significant mass graves have been discovered um, near a military base reported to contain up to 15,000 bodies. These sites and others like them at Kirkuk, Muhammad, Sakran, Basra and Abu Qasib contain remains buried en masse rather than in individual plots, signifying the deaths were the result of mass atrocities. Mr Speaker, the thousands of bodies uncovered in these sites are just a fraction of what Human Rights Watch estimates are 290,000 Iraqis that have disappeared during the reign of Saddam Hussein. Human Rights Watch was able to locate one such survivor of a mass execution and burial, and his account provided important evidence about the manner in which mass execution campaigns and burials were conducted. In 1991, a 12-year-old boy and several family members were accused by soldiers of being looters and detained with many other Iraqis. After a few days, these detained Iraqis, including the small boy, were taken by a bus to a location and thrown in a pre-dug pit, machine-gunned and then buried with a bulldozer. The young boy's mother and other relatives were executed and buried, but the boy miraculously survived to tell his tale. Mr Speaker, the um, coalition is doing what it can to ensure that uh, remains are treated with respect and with dignity, although clearly the sheer scale of what is being discovered makes it difficult to secure all of these sites. Obviously, this is a highly emotional issue for those Iraqis who are only now discovering the final fate of their missing relatives. The gruesome discovery of mass grave sites and heartbreaking accounts of personal tragedy and survival are a stark reminder, Mr Speaker, that the lives of the Iraqi people will be vastly better without Saddam Hussein. Um, Mr Speaker, I think um, it's fair to say that we're proud of the role we've played in securing the freedom of the long-suffering Iraqi people. Um, Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Immigration. I refer to the Minister's answers. Member for Sturt. Member for Reid has the call. I refer to the Minister's answers to my questions yesterday regarding an application for a protection visa. Did the Minister twice indicate in writing to the Member for Parramatta that he did not wish to exercise his ministerial discretion in the matter? Oh. Does the Minister recall saying in his 31st of the August 2001 letter to the member for Parramatta that, quote, I do not wish to be 
it to be brought to my attention again unless additional information is provided. Ooh. Can the minister now indicate how the matter was subsequently brought to his attention and just what specific additional information, not previously available to him or his department earlier, did he receive after the on the case after 31 August 2001? Will the minister table this documentation? Here, here. The Minister for Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, the minister um, has the call. I regret very much the nature of the questioning from the uh, member for Reid, which uh, impugned my integrity. And, uh, And, and, the which has, the call. and which has, and which has, I might say, served its member purpose. Member for Kingsford Smith. The minister. I am not being assisted by the member for Eden Monero, as must be awfully obvious to him. The minister has the call. He is entitled to be heard in silence. The minister. Um, it served its purpose because. Uh, some of our friends ensured that the nature of that story, which was quite wrong in suggesting that there was any link between donations and the grant of a visa, um, was uh, totally and absolutely untrue. I have never exercised my personal discretion in return for a donation. And uh, that was the insinuation. That was the smear. That was the smear. Um, the minister has the call. And, and, and let me say, and it served its the purpose. Member for Jagger Jagger, because, the minister has the call. Because some people saw fit to report it as if it might have some credibility. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Ballarat, the minister um, has the call. I will. Yes, look, I don't like these sorts of points being raised, I must say. Um, no, no, no. If it was, if it was a genuine question seeking information, seeking information initially, um, I, might, I might well have, uh, have wanted to respond in a way which would be cooperative and generous, as I usually am to you. But, 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 but let me... But let me make it. Let me make the it. Member for Lily. The minister has. Let the me call. make it abundantly clear the way in which this issue was dealt with, um, because uh, it ought to be put beyond absolute doubt. Because uh, uh, yesterday I made clear what the new information was. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, minister. I did. And, and, and you saw fit. You minister. saw fit to ignore it. You saw fit to ignore it. And you've been Minister. on radio today, um, suggesting, suggesting that uh, that there was no new information. Now let me let me let me just let me just take you through let me just take you let me just take you through the issue um, as as I understand it. Um, there was a request um, initially by some lawyers in Parramatta by the name of Harrisons um, involving this matter. Uh, I have uh, seen the initial request again, and it made clear to me that the only issue that was being raised uh, by the lawyer uh, on behalf of this gentleman was the handling of the matter before the RRT, the only issue raised. Um, I received further correspondence from the member for Parramatta. Um, that correspondence was referred to my department, and uh, the member for Parramatta um, raised the same issues. Um, he did not raise um, uh, the issue that ultimately influenced me in relation to this matter, um, and my department uh, referred to me a standard form letter that many of you may have seen from time to time, that having already entertained um, a, uh, an intervention request, as there was no further new information provided, um, that uh, I would not be considering it. Now that's the letter he received. It was not a fresh consideration of the matter. It was not a second intervention by me or consideration by me. Um, it is the case um, that after I saw on the, and I might say not before, um, but after the relevant function, um, and I wouldn't mention his name normally because I don't put uh, 
uh, information that I receive about individual cases into the public arena. Um, but I, I saw um, the Melkite bishop, Isham Darwish, um, who uh, then wrote some correspondence in relation to this matter, uh, as requested by me to, uh, to uh, enable me to have a fresh look at the matter. Now, I have made it clear in relation to interventions over a period of time um, that one of the factors that I do look at um, in relation to considering interventions where I might not otherwise intervene um, are ast substantial Australian connections. Well, um, substantial Australian connections. And, 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 and Member for Lawler. Um, we will, the minister um, has the call. You might see in a few months whether you minister want to comment further about the East Timorese. But let me, minister. But, but let me let me let me, just, let me just say I have made it I have made it clear to members who are looking for uh, the way in which I will deal with these issues, and it's not it's not it's, it's not it's not intended to be um, to cover the field, but it was an indication that. Uh, where people may have an application uh, that is marginal, um, but uh, in another area um, there are issues which also could have an impact but have a, a marginal impact. Um, I will look at those issues cumulatively to the assess. For where are we? Well, let me. Let me. I mean. The, the substantial Minister, issue that is, no always, that is always considered in relation to intervention requests and is most prominent in relation to where I do intervene are um, substantial Australian connections. Uh, they are the cases of spouses of Australians and particularly where they have, uh, um, they have children. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that we have so many interventions today, um, in relation to that particular area um, is because, is because um, the provisions that put in place a bar in the Act to further applications have been seen as appropriate to remain in the system to discourage people from coming to Australia in expectation um, that they've got a hunting licence to go out and find a spouse and enter into a relationship and expect that it will be accommodated on shore. Um, and that's, that's the reason for the bar. Uh, put in by former governments, we haven't taken it out. But where there are other issues, such as substantial family linkages, um, those those matters are considered. Now, uh, after uh, the approach, which included community representations, as uh, I have adverted to, um, people known to both the member and myself, um, including the bishop, a prominent doctor, and uh, and and community representatives. Um, well, you know that it's Mr. Kisawani. You know that, um, and um, and uh, uh, the, 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 look, the, the advice the advice from the bishop was on the 25th, no, 27th of uh, 27th of September, but tw September uh, 2001, 2001. I mean, the member was out there suggesting he knew when I was approached. He's suggesting he he was suggesting it was before the member for Cap member for Parramatta wrote to me. Uh, in fact, it was it was afterwards, it was afterwards, um, and it was after the function uh, that was adverted to, and uh, the fact, and, and, and the fact is, and the fact is that uh, that uh, I asked for I asked for for a uh, for a, uh, a brief to be prepared for me, um, and I dealt with it in in, in uh, January 2000 and, uh, 2002. Now, the member for I mean, the interesting aspect about this matter and, uh, um, is that there has been a lot of interest in it. There has been a lot of interest in it. Um, I was first approached in relation to this matter by the member for Kingsford Smith, um, and, uh, and uh, so he was supporting the first intervention. Um, the member for Blair, um, member for Petrie, minister has the call. The information. Minister. The information that I initially considered, Dunkley. I outlined fully yesterday, but I'll take it through you it, through it again. Minister, um, this was the issue in relation to the claims that were accepted by the Refugee Review, Review Tribunal that he'd rescued a Christian girl who'd been sexually assaulted by two Syrian workers in Lebanon. Uh, he claimed that he was accused of causing civil unrest and conducting anti-Syrian activities. He claims that following the incident, he was arrested, his house was damaged, and the 
um, and his car burnt by Syrian forces. His claim, he claims that he was held in captivity for 45 days without trial and interrogated and badly mistreated. Um, and, uh, the RRT accepted, accepted uh, that, uh, that he had been detained and mistreated by the Syrians in 1993. Um, but further found that that was not a convention reason. Um, now, the substantial difference when this matter came forward, which had never been raised before, was that this man had three Australian citizen sisters. Um, who, well, he did. Um, and they, they, it was a substantial Australian link, which I thought uh, warranted me looking at this issue again because of the seriousness, the seriousness of the issues raised. Minister, now, Minister. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence, and I expect the example to be set by the leader of the opposition. The minister. And the member for Jellybrand might care to come and accompany me in the chair before she makes that sort of assessment. <laughs> leader of the House. When the House has come to order. <laughs> Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, not only is there a constant barrage of interjections uh, from, amongst others, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, but Mr Speaker, uh, there have also been a number of interjections across the table uh, from the member for Reid, uh, clearly suggesting a bribe has taken place. This is grossly offensive, and the member for Reid ought to be instructed to withdraw to withdraw and apologise and not to repeat this grossly offensive smear against the Minister for Immigration. Member Griffith will resume, will resume his seat. Member Griffith will resume his seat. As is adequately illustrated by the member for Blair, and in this case the member for Boothby, interjections in fact have occurred on both sides of the of the chamber. I have been listening closely to the minister's reply and for much of the time he has been appropriately heard in silence. I did not hear any, any interjection from the member for Reid. I had in fact been closely watching the member for Reid because he had asked the question. I will continue to monitor the debate. To monitor the member for Hunter. The member for Griffith sought a point of order and I will hear him. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In your ruling just then, you've dealt with the matter I was about to raise. Oh. Member for Griffith. Well, Mr Speaker, no, on member the point Griffith, of order. No, member for Griffith, on a point of order, it, he has cleared the point of order. If he wishes to make any other comment, there are other forms of the House. I, I have accepted what he has said I invite him to resume his seat. Point of order. No such statement member of the type Griffith. alleged by the Leader of Member for Griffith to resume his seat. <laughs> member for Maranoa. I have indicated precisely what I witnessed. I stand by my view. The minister has the call. Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, I don't wish to add a great deal more. Um, it was clear that there was new material that was put before me. Um, and uh, let me just say that I've asked for some advice to be prepared for me on the number of occasions in which, um, in the uh, last uh, while, um, the, uh, the uh, issues in relation to my uh, intervention have been addressed. This program year I've had something of the order of uh, 4,000 fresh requests um, and uh, something of the order of 900 repeat requests. Um, I have uh, intervened in a number of occasions, um, approximately 80, I think, uh, where repeat requests have been made and additional information has been provided. I have done so for the Leader of the Opposition. Um, Member and, for uh, Lawler. Um, it was a second time. Um, but uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition um, would be aware that he's approached me on some 30 occasions. I've intervened on two. And one of those involved a repeat request. Um, the member for the member for uh, Reid has written to me seeking intervention on 62 occasions. I don't complain about that. 
Um, I have considered intervening on 25 occasions. Um, I might say um, that is an exceptional record. Um, uh, the minister has the call. There was no reflection in the remarks I made. There have been in others. Um, let me just say that uh, of the 25 cases, five of those cases involved uh, matters where Mr Ferguson subsequently approached me, uh, where initial consideration had been declined. So, uh, you know, what has happened is not unusual, uh, not different, um, and uh, the intervention power that I use, I use sparingly. Uh, with a, a great deal of care, um, and uh, I will continue to do that, um, and I won't allow um, the approach that you have taken to influence me in relation Minister, to the way in which I consider Minister, those matters. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister. Indulgence, Mr. Speaker. Um, on indulgence, um, what has happened here is that the member for Reid has asked a question which could only be construed as implying corrupt behaviour by the minister. The minister has repudiated that in a very convincing manner. Can I, can I ask the, the, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has the Mr. call. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, the Prime Minister has the call. I'm, 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 I'm asking you, the Mr. Member Speaker, for Fraser. I, I find, and everybody on this side of the House finds the behaviour of the member for Reid quite reprehensible. Yeah. Quite reprehensible, without foundation. The Prime Minister Mr. is speaking Speaker, on indulgence. And, I, and, and what, I, what I'm asking you, Mr. Speaker, to the, do is to is to invite. Clearly, the member for Banks understands only one language, and that is he is warned. And I might, Mr. Speaker, uh, ask um, you to invite the minister for the the member for Reid to apologise to the minister. When the House has come to order, the member for Lilly, yes, Mr. Point Speaker, of order, there are, member for Lilly, Mr. Speaker, the remarks of the Prime Minister. The member for Lilly is the member for Lilly seeking indulgence or a point I'm of order. I'm seeking indulgence, like the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm, in, I'm entitled to indulgence, like he was. The member for Lilly on a point of order. The Prime Minister's remarks were clearly a reflection on your last ruling. Clearly a reflection on your last ruling. The member for Lilly, member for Hindmarsh, it, member, does the member for Reid want to? No, member I for Reid. Member, for Reed, I would seek member for Reid will resume his seat. I must first deal with the, I would have thought, with the matter raised. Look, I sat here yesterday very uncomfortable with the member for Reid's question and, in fact, uh, and in fact required him to, um, the, the latter paragraphs of it, to be ignored. Today, when he came to the dispatch box, I was clearly very anxious to make sure that there was no repeat of what happened yesterday. There has, in my view, been no repeat of what happened yesterday. I heard nothing in the member for each question today that caused me alarm as the occupier of the chair. And I was anxious to ensure that the minister had every opportunity to be heard in relative silence. I do not believe that the, minister, that the member for each question yesterday was uh, entirely appropriate, though I allowed it to stand, I could not, in the light of today's performance, call for him to apologise. The member for Reid. Uh, Mr Speaker, I sought the uh, tabling of the documentation of this case, but I would seek to table the federal court uh, uh, decision in regards to this case uh, described as marginal. Yes, the, 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 the member for Reid has, I believe, sought to table a document. Is, is, tab is, is leave granted for the tabling of the document? I don't know if the Court of Australia. Order. Order. Neither, 
The member for Reid and the minister will resume their seats. We cannot have a debate across the chamber. Leave has been granted for the tabling of the document. The member for Lilly. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to request that the minister table the documents from which he was quoting and the advice from which he was quoting in the previous answer. Was the minister quoting from a document? Tabling no, the, the documents minister is obliged that are, that are, that are private, private but, documents but, relating to people's personal the, the, the minister is required, simply under the standing orders, to answer two questions from the chair, one of which he has loudly, la largely responded to. Was he quoting from a document? Uh, selectively, but they are confidential. Yes. And were the documents confidential? The answer to that he has just indicated. The member for Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Has the Minister seen claims by state governments about their expenditure on drought assistance? Would the Minister inform the House of the comprehensive payments being made by the Commonwealth as the drought continues? Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank, I thank the honourable member for Parks for his question and his ongoing interest in the drought, which affects, I think, virtually all of his electorate, and where there are obviously many farmers facing particular difficulties. The Commonwealth has moved to provide significant and comprehensive financial support for farmers during these difficult times. We've moved where states have failed to act. We're providing a range of assistance measures, many of which have never been offered in a drought situation before. We are also processing applications much faster than, e than ever before. And indeed, as soon as a prima facie case has been established, uh, farmers are eligible to receive interim assistance while their case is under consideration. Uh, we're taking about a third as long to consider the detailed applications as has occurred in the past. And this has already meant that uh, significant assistance is flowing to Australian farm communities. We've committed, in, in relation to the applications already before and, and agreed to by the federal government, uh, expenditure of around $950 million over three years. Indeed, no federal government in any drought in our history has made a contribution anything like uh, that amount. We have recognised the severity of the situation and whilst those numbers sound big and when they're all added together are indeed a very significant uh, contribution from the Commonwealth, we know that each one is dealing with a personal tragedy and, the, and a personal situation of great difficulty being confronted by an Australian farm family. So we've been prepared to stand by them and to offer as much assistance as we possibly can. In addition, of course, there's been substantial revenue foregone, foregone under the Farm Management Deposit Scheme. Uh, we've provided since 1997 around $800 million under the uh, AAA Agriculture Program, which provides support for farm training, for uh, the Farm Family Restart Scheme and, of course, rural financial councillors, which have been especially in demand over recent times. Now, if you compare that commitment with what's been offered by the states during this uh, arguably worst drought in our nation's history, the, 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 the comparisons are, are, are light and dark. Uh, compared with our almost one billion already committed to, to relief assistance in this drought, the states between them have managed something less than $60 million. It's really a pathetic effort. And in states like Victoria and Western Australia, they actually cut the assistance off as soon as Commonwealth assistance is available under the Exceptional Circumstances Program. Uh, around, uh, around 50 EC applications have either been lodged or are projected, and some of those applications are being lodged by states who have made absolutely no financial assistance at all to farmers in that region. They demand Commonwealth help while they're prepared to do nothing themselves. And many of these applications have covered huge areas, areas that have meant it's been very difficult for the independent arbiter, the National Rural Advisory Council, to make a decision about whether the area qualifies or it doesn't. They cover such a range of industry areas and geographical circumstances that some areas may qualify and others do not. And then when an application is declined because the state case has not been strong enough, we have state ministers actually going out criticising 
the Commonwealth Government because their application has failed. They would be far better off putting their time and energy into providing meaningful practical assistance at the local level and developing applications that are likely to meet the criteria, criteria which they signed off on uh, four or five years ago and have been a party in developing. So it is important that there be, a, uh, there be cooperation between the Commonwealth and the state in developing the applications and in then considering the appropriate method of, of, of assistance to be provided uh, in cases where there is severe drought. I want to emphasise, Mr Speaker, that unfortunately, because of the nature of the cases that have been presented or the way and or the circumstances in, in, in areas, some of the applications have not been successful. But in every instance, the Commonwealth and the National Rural Advisory Council has recommended that we review the case in the months ahead. And so there will be a constant review of uh, the circumstances of people in areas where applications have not been uh, accepted. And as soon as it's clear that an area meets the criteria, then we're willing to reconsider and to make that kind of a declaration. The states have a role in providing up-to-date information to ensure that those matters can be considered promptly, but what we certainly need to have is, instead of criticism and empty words from the states, a bit of performance, a bit of caring about the needs of farmers and a desire to actually ensure that benefits flow as quickly as possible. Uh, finally, Mr Speaker, let me say that the Commonwealth is aware of the fact that the current EC arrangements leave a lot to be desired. We have been trying to reform them now for more than two years and getting no cooperation from any of the states. Uh, what is important is that there be a spirit of cooperation and a willingness to try and provide benefits in the most effective way. States have never done less in a drought, never done less, never, never talked more, but never done less. But we haven't been prepared to have farmers suffer just because they've got uncaring state governments. We've been prepared to move in and provide realistic assistance, and we will do that until the drought's over. The Honourable Member for Reid. <coughs> Mr Speaker, my question is directed the to the Minister for, for Immigration. I refer to the Minister's last answer, and I ask, on what date did the Minister or his department first become aware of the visa applicants' relatives in Australia, specifically the three sisters? On what date did Bishop Darwish first write or contact the minister or his department? Will the minister confirm uh, that the matters for Reed, are— Member for Reed. The member for McKellar on a point of order. Standing order the 76. member for Blacksland seemed to find it very useful to make sure that points of order on my left are heard. He might extend the same courtesy to members on my right. The member for McClellan. Standing Order 76 says that all imputations or improper motives which are implied shall in fact be considered highly disorderly. So Standing Order 77 says that if it is disorderly you must intervene and then you go to section of Standing Order 303 or 304A or 306 and request that the member either desist or be removed from the House. Now the imputations that the member is making are quite plain and clear to see. And accordingly, Mr Speaker, I would ask you to rule in accordance with either 303, 304A or 306. The member for the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, everything that the member for Reid has uh, asked uh, and the said uh, in this House uh, uh, yesterday and today uh, is an allegation in effect of improper conduct. Now, if the member for Reid, if the member for Reid wants to proceed that way, there are clear forms under the standing orders. If the member for Reid wants to proceed that way, he must move a substantive motion. And this fishing, this disgusting fishing expedition, Leader should be ruled out of his seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. There are, of course, forms of the House and substantive motions when allegations of improper conduct are being made. I have listened closely to the member for each question, and he has to date asked for the minister to nominate a series of dates. I did not consider that out of order. Whether or not the minister has the, that as a question without notice is entirely, of course, at the minister's prerogative, but it is not, I think, a reasonable question. Remember, the minister. No, the, no, the minister finished his question. Unless the, did the minister have a point of order? No. I no, the, no. The member for Reid was interrupted on a point of order. 
Will the minister confirm that the two matters detailed today are the limit of the new alleged new information received after the 31st of August 2001? The Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Mr Speaker, um, in relation to the way in which this matter was dealt with, um, the uh, first uh, document I would have seen was on the uh, 1st of the 10th, 98. Um, that was um, an intervention request um, which was in the form of a schedule um, in which no reference was made uh, to the gentleman's family. The second relevant document is, is the uh, letter from the member for Parramatta. Uh, I, I probably have the date of it, but I refreshed my memory earlier by reading it. Um, the questions in relation to his family were not raised in that matter. I outlined that in uh, response to the earlier question. Um, uh, the bishop wrote to me. Um, on the uh, 27th of September, after I'd met with him on the 25th of September 2001. And uh, I have no idea um, whether my department um, may have received any other advice. Um, it wasn't brought to, well, I can ask, but I don't think it's relevant. Um, because it wasn't before me at the time when I first considered the matter. <laughs> it wasn't before me um, or the department at the time Mr Cameron wrote his letter. Um, but was before me when I made the decision in January 2002. Um, and uh, I, I simply affirm what I said before as to uh, the factors that uh, I considered at that time. Uh, look, I mean, the, the minister? I don't know. Um, the letter that initiated... The, well, no, the letter minister, that initiated... Minister, the chair. The letter that... Uh, Mr Speaker, the letter that initiated this matter uh, followed our meeting um, with the bishop uh, on the 25th of uh, September 2001, um, and the letter was written on the 27th of September. And that was after the dinner. The member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Would the Minister advise the House of measures being taken by the Howard Government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Would the Minister also inform the House of any new developments? Minister for Environment and Heritage. I thank the honourable member for Ryan for his question, and I also take this opportunity to thank him for representing me recently by launching the excellent book on Australian grasses, which has been produced by the Australian Biological Resources Survey. Mr. Speaker, Australia is very vulnerable to climate change, and this is why the government shares international concern about climate change and the challenge that it poses to our natural environment and to our economy. It was this government that established the first greenhouse-specific agency in the world with the Australian Greenhouse Office, and through a mixture of mandatory, voluntary uh, incentives and grants, has encouraged action which has meant that Australia has been a leader in greenhouse gas abatement. In fact, the measures that the government has taken so far are estimated to deliver some 60 million tonnes per annum of CO2 equivalent abatement each year by the year 2010, and that's equivalent to taking all Australia's passenger cars off the roads. Through the impact of new technology and improved standards, Australia is successfully now decoupling its economic growth from greenhouse emissions growth. Emissions per dollar of GDP were 24 per cent lower in 2000 than they were in 1990. Today I have announced the applications are now being sought for round three of the $400 million greenhouse gas abatement program. As a result of the first two applications rounds, 15 projects have already been offered a total of almost $145 million to abate more than 27 million tonnes of greenhouse gas during the period 2008 to 2012. Examples of these projects include funding of up to $26 million for combined heat and power cogeneration facilities to abate 3.25 million tonnes of greenhouse gases and funding of up to more than $40 million for several projects in New South Wales and Queensland to capture and use waste coal mine gas 
to abate over 7 million tonnes of greenhouse gases. Mr Speaker, this government is committed to meeting the target that we negotiated at Kyoto of 108% of 1990 levels. We are also developing a climate change forward agenda to cover the next 20 to 30 years that will lead a strong contribution to global climate control without sacrificing the competitive advantages that we have as a resource-rich nation. The Honourable Member for Reid. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Immigration. Does the Minister stand by his statement to the House yesterday that neither he nor the other minister with whom he checked, who I understand to be the Minister, Mr. Abbott, Mr. Minister Abbott, have, quote, any knowledge of any donations being made at that particular function? At Romeo's restaurant. Member for Reid. The Minister. Member for Booth, be on a point of order. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Standing Order 142 says that questions should relate to the area of the Minister's responsibility, and uh, page 526 of House of Representatives practice shows that speakers in the past have ruled out questions which relate to the actions, activities and statements by a minister's own party. Um, it therefore follows that this question, every part of it so far, has been out of order, and I ask you to rule it out of order. The Minister for the The Member for Boothby makes a point of order that I that I was, I'm dealing with the point of order. The member for Boothby makes a point of order that I was about to make myself. The members will be aware that on Tuesday, I think the member for Fraser raised the question of ministerial responsibility and party matters, and I'd subsequently reported back to he and the member for Lilly the um, House of Representatives practice comments reinforced by the member for Boothby. I do not believe that donations at a particular function could be deemed the, the business of either the Minister for Workplace Relations or the Minister for Immigration. The member for where are on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think you'll find that the question goes to an answer that the Minister provided yesterday. That's right. And having provided an answer in the House of Representatives yesterday, very clearly it's a matter of ministerial responsibility, improper accountability to the House in asking the Minister whether he stands by those remarks just yesterday. The Minister for Employment and Work. Oh, I'm sorry if he's not seeing. Um, order. I stand by my earlier comments that I cannot see how donations at a party function are the business of a minister or a member of the executive. In that context, the question is not in order and would need to be rephrased. The, the, oh, no, I'm sorry, I had already recognised the member for Lilly. On your day, Tony. <laughs> Manager of Opposition. The, uh, Mr Speaker, the Shadow Minister's question related directly to an answer given in this House yesterday by the Minister. Yes. Ha the Member for Lilly will resume his seat. I'm very happy to deal with that, what, what he regards as anomaly. In fact, of course, it related to a question that was much broader than the specific matter of donations. The, the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended, as will prevent uh, the member for Reid being compelled to move a motion of censure of the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs in order. Member for Prospect. Minister will resume his seat. Leader of the Opposition, the member for Rye Rankin, the member for Macmillan, the minister, particularly as leader of the House, is entitled to be heard in silence. He has the call. The member for Wills is warned. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Leader of the Opposition being compelled to move a motion of censure on the Minister for Immigration in place, in place of the innuendo and imputation he is attempting to make 
by means of questions without notice. Member for Kingston. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I am moving this way uh, because the conduct of the member for Reid, supported by the Leader of the yeah, Opposition yeah, yeah. and others opposite, has demeaned this parliament. The Mr. member for Lindiari has demeaned this parliament. Mr. Speaker, last night the Leader of the Opposition member for made Cornwall. a speech calling yet again for higher parliamentary standards, and today he comes into the parliament on a disgusting fishing expedition, a fishing expedition for which he has produced not a shred or a scrap of hard evidence. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, members opposite are entitled to ask questions seeking factual information. They are entitled to ask questions the seeking the factual Watson. information. What they are not entitled to do is to come into this parliament and smear and, and traduce the reputation of a decent and honourable member of this parliament, a the decent and honourable minister of the Crown. Mr Speaker, what has been alleged over the last two days by the member for Reid is that the Minister for Immigration rejected representations, then, after money was paid, that he changed his view on those representations. That is a disgraceful allegation. It is an absolutely disgraceful allegation, and such an allegation should never be made without hard evidence, hard evidence of which the member for Reid has not produced a single scrap. Now, I have to say, Mr Speaker, that this kind of disgusting behaviour, this kind of travesty uh, of, uh, of, of behaviour, this is typical of the Leader of the Opposition, a Leader of the Opposition who acts like a junkyard dog in this parliament uh, and then yeah. pretends to be a choir boy, pretends to be a choir boy Minister, as soon as Minister he will resume his seat. Member for Wera will resume his seat. The member for Wera will resume his seat. Minister will withdraw that comment. Mr Speaker, I, I withdraw and I apologise, Mr Speaker. But Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the Opposition's problem. Minister, member for where on a point of order? On the question of relevance, Mr Speaker, there's nothing in this the suspension motion that's about the Leader seat. of the Opposition. Member for where will resume his seat. The Minister has the call by any standard. The Minister was being relevant. He had, in fact, linked these remarks between the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Reid. Not a question whether I like it or not. I have, he has withdrawn. He has the call. Speaker, there is, there is only one reason why the member for Reid is persisting member in this for line of gutter tactics. Uh, there is only one reason why the member for Reid and members opposite are uh, floundering like rats in a sewer of their own making. Uh, there is only one reason for this, Mr Speaker. Member. Member for Batman on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I find the remarks of the Leader of the House yes, most Member offensive, un-Australian, and I ask they be Member withdrawn. Member for Batman resume his seat. The Member for Batman is aware that, undesirable though the remarks are, the requirement for withdrawal is that they are directed to an individual. The Leader. Speaker, well, Mr Speaker, well, Mr. Speaker, if it, if it would assist you and assist the House, uh, I'm, I'm happy to withdraw the comments. But the fact I is, Mr. Withdrawn. Speaker, that this Leader of That's the Opposition no has put the member for Reid up to this. This Leader of the Opposition, assisted by the management team, and what this Leader of the Opposition is on about is a grubby fishing expedition designed to traduce the reputation of the Minister. Minister, Minister resume his seat. The member for Reid on a point of order. I take the censure. Member Reid will resume it? his seat. Member Reid will resume his seat. The minister has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, finally it seems, finally it seems, the member for Reid uh, is prepared to move a censure motion. Well, Mr. Speaker, why didn't he come in here and do it yesterday? Why didn't he come in here and do it yesterday, rather than traduce the forms of this house, rubbish the reputation of this minister, uh, bring the parliament into disrespect by abusing all the proper standards that ought to be in place in this place, Mr. Speaker? The member, for, the member for Reid, the member for Reid, in cahoots with the leader of the opposition, has unfairly 
and dishonestly smeared the reputation of the Minister for Immigration. He shouldn't be able to get away with it. He's demonstrated nothing, and it's about time for him to put up or shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the motion be agreed to? All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The member for Reid. Mr. Speaker, I move that this House censures the Minister for failing to adequately explain to the House the alleged new information that he relied upon to approve the visa application of Bedwani Habish, which he had previously rejected. Yeah. 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 And uh, I'm asked by the Leader of uh, Government Business why I didn't uh, do it earlier. Well, I've only become aware overnight that he was at the function himself. Oh, oh, and, uh, oh. Uh, he's uh, one of the witnesses relied upon uh, in regards to there being no previous donations. The situation is that this case has been through the normal processing system. It has been examined internally by the department uh, and uh, the allegations of uh, rape and incarceration and persecution by Syrian forces were dealt with by the department and then the RRT. And despite the attempts of the minister to indicate that the RRT might have provided a few favourable comments in regards to Mr Bedwani's case, the reality is that the federal court found him to be a particularly untrustworthy witness. And uh, what we have here is a situation where uh, the uh, member for Parramatta Made a number of uh, uh, made a number of uh, endeavours on this matter. They were clearly rejected by the minister. All of his persuasive powers and influence were unable to turn this case around. Uh, I, and uh, I, I reluctantly interrupt the member for Reid because, as the clerk has pointed out, we're not in the house is not in possession none of his resolution. If you could hand the blue. With the resolution, the House would be in possession of it, and the debate can proceed. The member for Reid. Uh, as I Water. said, uh, the, uh, the situation was that uh, the uh, member for Parramatta was unable, in any manner, to persuade the minister as to the bona fides of this case. And, member, uh, minister for citizenship. It is extremely interesting that uh, Bishop Darwish is quoted in the media today uh, as to the nature of this case. And what does he refer to? Does he refer to the matters raised by the minister uh, about uh, the, the truth of the case, which were to deal with rapes and uh, tussles between Syrians in uh, northern Lebanon and uh, issues of incarceration? The bishop, who supposedly was so persuasive of the minister, was so telling, which turned his views around. Uh, the, minister, the bishop in the, in the paper today refers to the member being a, a previous member of the South Lebanese army which is not even part of the case. It's not even a fact in the whole case. This is the man who persuaded the minister that this person should, should live in Australia, that he should become another one of the 14 to 1,500 privileged people who have been allowed to stay Hyde here Marsh. as permanent residents the after, for having Hyde been, Marsh. after having been rejected by the department. I warn the member for Hindmarsh. The RRT and the federal court. So the person who was so persuasive, so telling, to, to turn the minister around, far more influential allegedly than the member for Parramatta, he's out there today putting facts about the case which indicate he knows nothing whatsoever about the case. That the person was not even that the person was a member of the SLA when he wasn't. Now the situation uh, clearly, the minister used yesterday, the minister yesterday came in here and said that he and another minister had no recollection of this fundraising function that any money changed hands. They just for fun went to Parramatta, sat around talking about the, the weather uh, and uh, basically went home. Uh, overnight, of course, uh, the member, uh, overnight the member for Parramatta has clarified the minister that $22,000 was actually collected and we have... And, uh, we have uh, and we have uh, we have Mr. Uh, we have we have uh, Mr. Kizawani today out there in the media saying that leader of the opposition. We had uh, Mr. Kizawani out there today 
confirming that 22,000 was collected for the members of Parramatta, and of course trying to put forward an argument that the person uh, who was assisted uh, could not in a million years have provided any money because he allegedly had uh, five children, was poverty stricken and there's no way he could provide any money. Well, the facts of life are that the person concerned has three children, uh, is a uh, very effective, fully employed cement renderer who owns his own house uh, and uh, who, uh, uh, who owns his own house uh, and drives around in a Range Rover. So there we have the Confederates of the Minister, the Confederates of the Minister attempting to basically dismiss the, 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 the credibility of those that are raising this case. Now the situation is that large numbers of people are rejected every day of the week on the same grounds that this person now remains in Australia. Yeah. The essential grounds are that there are Syrian forces in Lebanon, uh, they, uh, uh, many Maronites and Melkites and Orthodox believers allege that they are harassed and victimised, and, uh, and these are the grounds which Mr Ruddock's the Minister's Department rejects every day of the week. If you look at RRT cases, they, ferret, they are very unfavourable to this type of case. The, this, this, the person that he has allowed in Australia was found by the federal court to be extremely unconvincing, a very poor witness. And when the minister comes in here today and he says, despite my rejection of the minister of Parramatta, despite the RRT, despite the federal court, despite internal processing by Demia, I'm letting him stay in Australia because he had three sisters. Let's get real. If that was the basis for uh, ministerial discretion and intervention, there'd be about 4,000 a year coming in under the, under the criteria. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 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 th th that is the reality. You know, that basically, uh, we, th we, only, we don't let people in here under normal family reunion just because they've got three sisters here. We've got a person here who's been found to have no substantial refugee humanitarian claim whatsoever, supposedly persuaded. But, 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 sorry, he is able to be uh, allowed to remain permanently because the minister allegedly found out for the first time that he had three sisters here. Now, it's interesting that the minister, in yesterday's uh, uh, coverage of the issue, he recounted every single part of this person's life story. Yeah. Every single detail was there, but no mention of the, the, the sisters three. yesterday. Yeah. The three sisters didn't get a run yesterday. Right. The, this, this, this case, which so impacted upon him, this letter from this bishop that so turned him around, he couldn't even remember the reasons yesterday. Uh, so uh, one has to uh, doubt how uh, substantial that factor really was. What has happened here? A few community leaders, quote, in other words, Mr. Karim Kizawani, uh, a very close, long-term associate of the minister, obviously rang him up after this function and said, "Philip, I want this one through to the keeper." That's the community. Rep that's the yes, obviously. That's the community representation that occurred here, and the donation made at the function by Mr Kizawani on behalf of Mr Habish is a fact of life. And, and the ministers opposite who lead up want us to believe the minister the ministers want us to believe the that order. they went as of yesterday they went the to call. this function and they were, they did not see minister any money being affairs. raised to the fundraiser. They just walked around, uh, no money received, uh, nothing happened. Uh, you know, let's get. And uh, as I uh, indicated, I was attempting earlier to minister get the minister to guarantee, to guarantee that no money had changed hands. And quite frankly, we have procedural points and other efforts made so that the minister doesn't have to stand by his statement yesterday when he said he didn't know about money. Now, as I say, the use of ministerial discretion is a very serious matter. At various stages, some ministers have actually abolished it because they thought it was open to distortion, they thought it was open to political influence peddling, they thought it was open to ethnic kind of pleasing of communities, they thought there was a possibility of corruption there. There are ministers in the past who abolished this because they were concerned about the way it was utilised and the way it might be perceived. Now the minister said that he has uh, allowed approximately a thousand people into this country, over a thousand people in this country, on the basis of a ministerial discretion which is untested, not transparent to the Australian public. No one knows why these cases are decided. Because often they are for good reason, because, for instance, the Department of Foreign Affairs' uh, papers that they put to the Immigration Department might 
be somewhat hostile to or favourable to a particular regime overseas, and the minister might correctly come in and say, well, I think that the uh, DFAT uh, uh, position is too hardline or too softline the case. There are other cases where there are very compelling reasons why people should remain in Australia for family reasons. Obviously, if people have a young child who is an Australian citizen, that can be a very real factor. Are we saying that a person should be uh, deported when they do have very close family here? But to say that somebody with such an atrocious case, recognised as such by the federal court as well as the RRT, should remain here simply because he has three sisters is preposterous. Mr. The minister would realise that he would reject week after week. He would reject similar cases. This is not a novel, unusual proposal. It is Member not, the, this man is not the first claimant in this country who has been rejected and went to ministerial discretion and was basically rejected and sent home having three, four, five, six, seven, eight siblings. That's the reality. This is nothing unusual in this case. To say that uh, all, of, all, of the, all the processing of this department, all the integrity of our immigration system, all, all of the public service effort, all the people that we appoint to tribunals, that should all be thrown out because somebody has three sisters in the country. That is preposterous, and it's not the real reason why this case, why this case was uh, decided in this fashion by the minister. The reality is that uh, uh, the reality is that uh, that, that uh, a function was attended, uh, uh, donations were made. Uh, a person who was instrumental in these donations then went to the minister Member and asked the minister Robertson. asked the minister to. Uh, uh, to basically do him a favour in this case. Now, the federal court decision, total, uh, uh, 70 FCA 1998, absolutely demolishes the witness as a, as a credible person in any way whatsoever. What? And uh, if I can, uh, Justice O'Connor uh, went went very deeply into the uh, integrity of the person. He referred to, tri to tribunal comments. The tribunal did not accept the claim made for the first time at the tribunal. Made for the first time, the, tri the claim made for the first time at the tribunal hearing that a cousin with a high-ranking position with the Department of State Security renewed the applicant's passport. Furthermore, in respect of the 1996 incident, the, the crucial Reed, reason for the refugee claim. The member, the member for Reed, the member for Cook. On Mr. A, Speaker, on a, I refer to Standing Order 85. Uh, it's re regards uh, tedious repetition. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Reid has the call. So, <laughs> quoting, quoting further from that decision, in respect of the 1996 incident, the tribunal found it implausible. Quote. Furthermore, the tribunal did not accept that the applicant was wanted by the authorities. Quote. Furthermore, the tribunal did not accept the claim made for the first time at the tribunal that a cousin with a high-ranking position, etc., etc. They're saying that this person is a totally disreputable witness. They're saying he has no refugee humanitarian case whatsoever. They're saying that he should not be allowed to come into this country in the limited number of people, approximately 12,000 a year, that we take out of 25 million refugees around the world. This person is so privileged. 12,000 get in here a year at most out of 25 million people who are out of their homes, exiled from their countries, facing torture and persecution. And, and the minister comes in here and says, I am letting this person be amongst that privileged 12,000 this year because he's got three sisters in the country. What? This is a, this is a Member, government. Minister for Citizenship. This is a government that we experienced last year with the Tampa, demolishing people besmirching their image. Talk about people being smeared. A government which smeared refugee claimants said, said that they were uh, totally that they were totally fallacious. Said that they were. And, uh, member, the minister, were the member for Reid has the call, implying they were terrorists. That's right. This this government, which which is so vigilant supposedly, so vigilant about not having improper entry into this country, the so dedicated Fisher. to border protection, a government which. Is, is uh, trying to convince the Australian electorate they're credible, they're trustworthy, they believe in proper processing. That's that's the, that's the, that's the commitment they supposedly make. And I warn we, the member for Fisher. And now we have a case here where, uh, after a function of Parramatta, where a donation is made in the presence of two ministers on behalf of a then pending claimant, 
we find that he comes into this very privileged room. Shame. These are the people, as I say, they've been out there trying to undermine, uh, smear, slander refugee claimants, and then they themselves, under their own discretion, allow somebody on this basis. And uh, as the minister knows, it's non-compellable. All that the Australian Parliament and the Australian people know about these cases were how many were approved each year, how many the previous year, what proportion were accepted and rejected, etc. Et no details of uh, what countries they stem from, no, no, no uh, ability to, to test whether there is a pattern, to test whether there is a pattern of, let's say, influence, influence peddling amongst particular ethnic communities. Not, no possibility of the Australian electorate knowing that these people who are supposed to refugees are really entering the country because there might be this person in a particular electorate who is uh, close to the party, might be able to deliver an electoral vote to them. No way the Australian electorate can examine that. And we've had a point blank refusal by the minister today to actually table the reasons for, for this grant. We had him at the last minute today. Uh, after some overnight consideration, I gather, saying that it was about these three uh, sisters. No mention yesterday. Nothing at all. He recounted every single facet of the bloke's life. You know, next thing we'll be knowing whether he had uh, ten dinos in his pocket or something. That was the kind of level of, of development he had yesterday. Everything had happened in the past. Everything the tribunal knew about, we heard from yesterday. And he tried to imply. Member for Canning. He tried to imply this was the new evidence because the rest of Australia hasn't got the file. They might believe that what he said yesterday was the end of this, that they had all these pressing arguments. These, in fact, are the pressing arguments that were rejected by the system. He didn't come up with any new reasons yesterday, and that's why, quite rightly, the opposition has had to press him again today to try and find out the specifics of this decision. Now, uh, the uh, situation uh, is that uh, this particular community is uh, very close to the minister. He has a very strong following in it. And uh, I dare to say that uh, if one was to analyse decision making under this uh, ministerial discretion, one would find a pattern. One would find, one would find order. A, 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 a member for Reed has the call. Uh, now, as I said, uh, and uh, not only not only do not only do I want not only do I want the minister to basically come forward and detail the whole file to see whether there's really Gender. anything more convincing than Three Sisters, but I want him to actually stand by yesterday's statement that no donations were made to the Liberal Party at that function, that no donations on were made on behalf of Mr, Mr. Habishi. That's right. uh, and it wasn't a very crowded function, so I don't think the activity got lost in the mist. Romeo's, as the Minister for Workplace Relations would know from his visit there for that night, uh, is not uh, an expand, expansive operation uh, with thousands of people present. Uh, I don't think that the minister missed that detail. That uh, uh, he uh, he and uh, he confirmed this with his colleague that uh, they weren't aware of any money uh, being raised that night. I want him to reiterate that today to, get, to, to say that no money did take was offered there. By him on his behalf. You, well, no. you better read Hanson. Member for Reid. Member for Reid. Uh, yeah. Minister. Member for Reed, you, you, yesterday you detailed that you confirmed with the minister that uh, you had no memory, no knowledge of money me, me, being, being raised at the function. Now, we can hide behind technicalities. The clear facts, in conclusion, are that a person had went through the normal processing minister of this country, processing that this minister is trenchant in support of. This minister is so strong on repeat applications for uh, discretion that he actually, his office says, well, look, from now on, if a person is coming to us for a second uh, uh, consideration by the minister, we, will still seek to we can still seek to deport that person while the minister is considering it. He is so strong in guarding against abuse of, of, of secondary, second and third and fourth repeat applications for his discretion that he's actually saying, in future, because people were exploiting it before to remain in Australia for lengthy times, I'm going to actually have them deported possibly in the time when they're being considered. He's, he's, he's got a process from his 1999 uh, guidelines. From his 1999 guidelines, he says in there that a public servant will look at the less relevant, uh, unimpressive, totally fraudulent cases, not even bring them to my attention. Just send off a letter to the member for Parramatta or whoever it is, saying I don't even need to see that. That's how bad the case was. 
that the public servant didn't even show him to him, apparently. Right. And this is because the minister is saying that the system was being abused. I don't want to see second and third approaches to me. I want to use the discretion once and once only, essentially, because there is, it is being abused. And yet here today, uh, we've got a situation where uh, a, an approach is made and somebody is allowed in the country. Now, quite frankly, if, if people over there don't think this is serious, I think that the abuse of the immigration system through uh, uh, the refugee humanitarian uh, sector is a very serious matter. It's a thing that many members deal with daily. And if people start to believe that all you've got to do is know the right person in the right community, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the right party, at the right functions, Order. then quite frankly, it's a, it's a very sad day in Time immigration process expired. in this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is the motion seconded? Motion moved by the member for Reid is a motion of, second, uh, of censure of the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the minister. Mr. Speaker, um, let, me, uh, Order. let me deal with these issues in a uh, comprehensive way. Um, it, uh, it is the case that people can have different views about the way in which a particular matter might be addressed. Um, the discretion that I have to exercise is one that I take and treat with very considerable care. Um, the parliament has recognised that, uh, on a, that occasions could arise where it would be in the public interest to grant a visa even though a person did not meet normal criteria for a grant. Um, and it's for this reason that the legislation gives me the personal power to substitute where I consider it to be in the public interest for a decision with the RRT or the RMRT, a decision more favourable to the applicant. Individuals do make requests to me. Many members of parliament make requests to me. And as I said earlier, um, I am free to exercise that power where I consider it to be in the public interest, irrespective of whether a person has in fact made a request. Uh, but it is also the case um, that I can decline to intervene. Um, the fact that I decline to intervene is not a decision to reject, um, and there is, no, there is no restriction on people coming back and seeking to raise matters with me. And as I indicated, uh, some 80 decisions have been made which were on second requests. I indicated five of them uh, were in response to requests made by the Honourable Member for Reid. Now, that's, that's, that's the point I made, and one by the Leader of the Opposition. Now, um, the point I do make in relation to these matters um, is that uh, I, uh, I exercise that responsibility with a great deal of care, but I'm not going to suggest that, uh, that uh, a decision that I take would be replicated in every case in exactly the same way by somebody else bringing their own mind to bear in relation to this matter. But I did spell out yesterday um, in Hansard, um, at the end of the day, uh, the basis upon which I made this decision. And I am surprised that the member for Reid um, is suggesting uh, that uh, what I said today is substantially different in any way to what I said yesterday. And um, because... The minister has the call. No. And Mr. Mr Speaker, as I find the place, I will actually quote uh, fully to the honourable member, and it will become clear to all members when they hear it uh, that uh, in, this particular, in this particular case um, I put the same information yesterday um, that I put today. Um, and on page... Uh, 14,804, uh, 14, I had this to say. The point I make is that the RRT accepted that the applicant had been detained and mistreated by the Syrians. In addition, the man had substantial Australian connections. In other words, he had a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia. I weighed those matters up and determined an intervention was appropriate. 
I disclosed to the parliament yesterday the three sisters. The three sisters. Uh, yes, I did. In other words, he had a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia, and I weighed those matters up and determined that an intervention was appropriate. I mean, you weren't listening. Minister, you weren't listening. Um, it was quite clear. It was quite clear. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that I didn't say that the that the relatives were three sisters, um, I made it clear. That the leader the, of the opposition. I made it. I made it clear. I made it clear uh, that he had uh, a number of relatives who were permanent residents and citizens of Australia. That was a different factor that was not known to me before, and which coupled uh, with the concern I had about the finding of the tribunal. Um, and uh, I repeat it again that, the, uh, uh, that in respect of the 1993 incident, the tribunal accepted that the applicant had been detained by the Syrians and he was mistreated in Tripoli. And I might say those matters were uh, the subject of an adverse finding because they did not constitute a convention reason. Uh, there were other matters raised on that, uh, uh, on, on that matter. Um, in which the tribunal did not make positive findings, um, but uh, that in no way derogates uh, from the fact uh, that, unlike most cases I see <coughs> where the, uh, the tribunal says uh, that I do not believe the individual, he has no credibility and I do not accept any of the claims that he has made, there was a specific finding, a very specific finding, in respect of the 1993 incident that the tribunal accepted. Um, and it was on that basis that, uh, that I elected in this particular case to intervene. Now, uh, there were only two other points of substance uh, raised by the, uh, uh, by the uh, or three other points of substance raised by the member for Reid, which I, uh, I see fit to, to deal with. Um, the first is in relation to Bishop Darwish's comments in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, I think it was, or one of the newspapers. Well, it was the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, what I know is that, uh, uh, that uh, the newspapers yesterday had uh, the member for Reid uh, issuing a press release uh, which contained a background information sheet on ministerial discretion under section 417. And, uh, uh, besides the fact that the, uh, that the uh, member uh, evidences some abysmal uh, knowledge about what actually happened, um, what he was putting into the minds of the journalists was that, in some way, decisions taken by me under 417 were related to um, the South Lebanese Army. In fact, paragraph 3, he says, there was public concern when the minister used 417 to allow into Australia 200 Lebanese people either associated with members uh, with or members of the Israeli-backed South Lebanese Army, and some of those members had tortured and murdered Palestinians and so on. Now, um, now let me just say, uh, 417 was never used for that purpose. Um, they were allowed under the Special Humanitarian Program, and they had to meet character, um, and, it, and it meant that amongst a large number of people who in fact applied, a very significant proportion were unable uh, to access those visas under the Special Humanitarian Program. But I wouldn't be surprised if Bishop Darwish was rung up um, by a journalist and said, uh, was this man in some way linked with forces in Lebanon? And then, and then the journalist verbals him and says, oh, that's the South Lebanese Army. That wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I certainly have, I, cert, I, cert, I certainly know the difference between the South Lebanese Army and, and the uh, Lebanese forces who were a, uh, a Christian militia in Lebanon. Um, the fact is that they were quite different. They fought in very different theatres, um, and they are quite distinctive. Um, and, uh, and I suspect um, that it was more likely um, uh, a journalist not dealing with those issues fully, particularly when the argument had been advanced that this issue in some way had some relationship to the South Lebanese Army by the member for Reid, who was hawking this around the press gallery yesterday. Now, let me just uh, deal with the other imputation. Uh, that the member raised about the nature of my decision-making. I did actually have the department take out uh, advice for me 
uh, on my recent decision making in relation to uh, in relation to intervention requests under section 345 351 and 417 from July 2000 until December 2002 um, and uh, the largest number of interventions were on behalf of Fijians 123 um, Lebanese were next at 105 Indonesians at 72 Sri Lanka at 65 and the Philippines at 65 now what you, what you have to look at in relation to that decision-making um, is that uh, uh, the decisions I take are based upon case-by-case -case determination. Um, the numbers will obviously vary from time to time, Member for Brisbane. Um, and uh, you do have uh, areas in which, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, you do have areas, Mr. Speaker, where uh, interventions are more likely. Um, because of the extent to which uh, people have entered Australia from particular cohorts and overstayed those visas and over a period of time entered into relationships um, which are likely to prompt a, uh, an intervention request. Uh, finally, let me just say I don't know whether the Labor Party has a fundraising code, um, but our party does. And uh, the fact is that under that fundraising code, Members of Parliament are Member at arm's McKellar. length from the Member process, Reed. and I remain at arm's length from that process. I always have. I don't make inquiries in relation to uh, in relation to donations. I don't make inquiries in relation to uh, outcomes. Um, occasionally, I, I might I might see people paying to go into a function. Uh, I may see a raffle. Um, uh, you know uh, that that can happen. Um, but, but, but let me say uh, what I said yesterday in relation to this matter, because I don't resile from it at all. Um, I said uh, um, I have no knowledge. I do not remember every case that has been raised with me. I think it would be unreasonable to expect that I would, in fact, uh, uh, that that I would, in view of the fact that you are asserting that it is probably more than a thousand, I will look at the background to it, and I will assess what the situation finally was. Uh, or, or situation was. Finally, let me say that I attend many functions in which people pay to enter and where people are involved in fundraising activities. The I have no knowledge of the nature of those fundraising activities. I never seek to inquire. I certainly have no knowledge of the sorts of claims that are being made by the honourable member. That situation remains, um, and uh, it was the situation that it was the answer I gave yesterday. It was a full and complete answer about the, the state of my knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I say this issue goes to the heart of the moral legitimacy, or should I say illegitimacy, of the Howard government. The coalition turned the last election campaign into a referendum on who could best maintain the integrity of our immigration system. They won that election after polluting public opinion with what was nothing short of deliberately manufactured lies, and Minister Ruddock knows that from yeah. children overboard. They denigrated and vilified genuine refugees to manipulate public opinion. And now we learn, now we learn, after that election, after children overboard, after CivEx, that what they've done is they've turned the integrity of our immigration system into their own political and financial plaything. They certainly decide who comes into this country and the circumstances in which they come. They certainly decide that and it's got a dollar sign attached to it. That's what we know from these events. And I'm going to take you through these events in a way in which Minister Ruddick Lawler. didn't in that incredibly pathetic defence to what are serious allegations. Let's just go through this, Minister. Let's just go through it very carefully. Here's a bloke. Here's a bloke who makes a protection visa application on the 1st of July 1996. He gets knocked back by the department on the 10th of March 1997. He gets knocked back by the Refugee Review Tribunal on the 2nd of April 1997. 
He gets knocked back by the federal court in June 1998. An interested Liberal member of parliament, presumably held in some esteem because he's a parliamentary secretary, writes twice. Writes twice, and it gets knocked back both times. And what's Minister Ruddock's case here? Minister Ruddock's case is, oh, two things changed my mind. One was a bishop. Well, I still, I still want to know, Minister, and you didn't answer this. You didn't answer this, and you didn't make it clear in question time. And the only thing that would make it clear is tabling the file. Is when you were first approached by that bishop. Yes. Your answer today, your answer today was. 24th of September, and then he wrote on the 27th. But I talk to that bishop all the time. Well, the way of absolutely proving you've had your go, no, Minister, and you Lawler, didn't answer no, this allegation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way of member for Lawler, I have allowed a large number of views, but it is appropriate to address your remarks to the chair. All right, uh, Minister, Minister Ruddy. Uh, no, member, member for Lawler, will resume his seat. No, 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 but. but uh, Member for Prospect, just 30 seconds, or even three. The member for Prospect. Point of order, then. You have allowed the minister in this parliament continually to use the word you, and yet you interrupt the member speakers for on our side for doing seat. the same thing. The member for Prospect will resume her seat. That is an outrageous suggestion. I will, in fact, personally run through the Hansard with a yellow pen, indicating the number of times in which I draw the minister's attention to the matter while he was speaking. And I've done the same thing to the member for Lawler. The member for Lawler. The thing that would have answered that allegation about when the bishop the first intervened in this matter would have been tabling the file. Yeah. The only answer that's been given to that is to protect the privacy of this protection visa applicant. Well, we've already got on the Hansard the person's name and the Dimia file number. What more is there to protect? But Minister Ruddock, if you want to give us that file with the name scrubbed out wherever it appears, we'll take that file, Minister Ruddock, and we'll be looking for when the bishop first contacted you. Yeah. But let's assume, let's assume that the version the minister has put is the correct version. Since when did a bishop matter? As the shadow minister for immigration, my office is littered, littered with correspondence from bishops, from priests, from nuns, from rabbis, all of which doesn't make a difference in 417 matters. I've just said to the staff, go and grab the first three, and they've come back with these. We've got. I'll see your bishop and raise you an archbishop. We've got an. <laughs> we've got an arch. We've got an archbishop in Adelaide who's personally intervened on behalf of an Iranian detainee in uh, the Baxter Detention Centre. I think he is. He's certainly detained. 417 of the Act, and Minister Ruddock doesn't go, oh dear me, an archbishop. I better just go the tick here because that's what I always do when I see a bishop making an, an application. He says. Uh, how, you know, writes back and says, uh, your request for the exercise of my power was referred to me. However, I've decided not to consider exercising my power under section 417 of the Act. So, so somehow a bishop was the difference in this case, and an archbishop here doesn't make any difference. And then, of course, as honourable members on this side know, there's the East Timorese. There's more yeah, bishops yeah. over the East Timorese matter than there is on the chessboard. I mean, it is completely absurd to say that if you respond to the interventions of church figures, that you wouldn't have already made a positive indication in relation to the East Timorese when every Catholic bishop in Australia, and I note that Minister Rabbit is nodding his head here, he probably knows a little bit about the Catholic Church, every Catholic bishop in Australia has made representations on behalf of the East Timorese. Well, you know, that, 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 that hasn't. Oh, well. Well, I tell, tell you something we've guaranteed through this debate. I reckon we've got 1,650 East Timorese visas. Yeah. We've guaranteed that. Because you'd look fools if you didn't do that now. You'd look fools if you didn't do that. So we've obviously guaranteed Member that. We've already guaranteed Minister. that. Then Minister. All, oh, 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 Minister. Then, then, then on the intervention of church figures, we've got the Coalition for the Protection of Asylum Seekers, who actually say no deportations. Bishop George Browning, uh, the spokesperson for the Federation of Islamic Councils. We've got a nun, Sister Aileen Crow. We've got a, another uh, uniting church Sister figure, Frances Milnes, of course. Sister Janet Mead, I've forgotten her. She advocates for asylum seekers. We've got a rabbi. None of them, of course, have had positive results when they've made interventions. So since when, Minister, has the intervention of a bishop been the difference? Since when has it been the difference? I reckon if 
we actually could get some public transparency on your non-reviewable, non-compellable discretion, we would actually find that a church figure intervenes in most of them, and that isn't the difference between you saying yes or you saying no. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go through all the correspondence in my office with these church figures, and I'm going to write back to them with the suggestion that next time, instead of sending a letter, they ought to go to a Liberal Party fundraiser because it has better results. Presumably, presumably we'd get a discount for the East Timorese in bulk, so if we get together two or three hundred thousand dollars, we should be right, because that was the difference in this case, not the intervention of the bishop. Then the other thing that the minister says is the difference is having Australian family, and then contends that somehow this only came to his attention on the third 417 matter, not the first one, not the second no, one, no, but the know. third one. Well, the federal court didn't know. Well, if that version is right, Minister Ruddock, if that version is right. The member for Parramatta is the most incompetent, the most incompetent member the House of Representatives yeah, has ever yeah. seen. Because, because who, who would put together a letter? Who would go to the Minister for Immigration twice, so interested that he goes twice, without having interviewed the people involved and marshalled every fact in their favour, including Australian family. Yeah, and I know that members here, because they represent very multicultural electorates, I know that many of them do write to you and do seek to see you about these sorts of matters, and when they do, they make sure that they've got every fact. But, Minister Ruddock, if the member for Parramatta is that incompetent, you can prove that today Mem once again Lawler. by tabling the file. Once again, by tabling the file. And if you table that file and the, minister, and the member for Parramatta couldn't be bothered putting in the details of people's family circumstances, and Dimia never worked it out, and the RRT never worked it out, and the federal court never worked it out, and the lawyers acting for this bloke never worked it out and never used it as a fact, if that is what you are actually saying, member Minister Ruddock, which would be extraordinary, truly extraordinary, then prove it by the production of the file. Yeah. The fact that you haven't put the file before this parliament can only inexorably lead to the conclusion that the file doesn't support the case that the bishop was the difference, a contention that really we know from other files is clearly absurd, doesn't support the case that you only came to knew about the family by the third time that you were looking at this matter, it must support the case that you knew about these things earlier. And can I just make an additional point on this? If the ministers on the question of competency, because you know the minister, there's an old saying in, in Australia, the money or the box. Well, I think this motion should be the money or the incompetence. Because if the minister is truly saying it took until the four, third 417 for him to become apprised of the basic facts of this matter, then what he is saying to the Australian community is he weighs in his hands matters that could go to life and death because that's what can happen if people are returned in bad circumstances overseas. He weighs in his hands matters going to life and death without having taken the opportunity to inform himself of the simplest facts that relate to them. So if that is really your case, the money or the Member incompetence, I, my, I, I'm still barracking for the money, but the only, alternate, <laughs> the only alternate case is gross incompetence, incompetence by the member for Parramatta and by you, because why would you be dealing with a matter as serious as whether a person who has claimed persecution can stay in this country without having got every fact, every fact before you and having weighed it. So you, you stand condemned either way and this censure should be carried either way. But as I say, I am still barracking for the money. Why am I still barracking for the money? Because we know there was a fundraiser. That hasn't been denied. We know Minister Ruddick was at the fundraiser. That hasn't been denied. Uh, he's clearly conferred with a ministerial colleague about the fundraiser. We suspect that to be Minister Abbott, so Minister Abbott was there. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, there were other members of parliament there, or at least one other member of parliament there. We know $22,000 was raised. Uh, now, Mr Speaker, I presume you're above fundraising because of uh, the high office you hold. Uh, but for those of us who engage in fundraising, we know $22,000 isn't a bad haul on a night for a fundraiser <laughs> at a Lebanese restaurant called Romeo's. Uh, I'll, I'll have a quiz night in my electorate tomorrow night, and let me tell you, I'll be lucky to walk away with $2,200, not $22,000. 
That's the way that political party fundraising goes when you've got a dinner here and a plate of dips there and a raffle to follow. We, we all know that's how it goes. $22,000 raised at a night at Romeo's restaurants. That's not denied. That's not denied. And also, what isn't denied or guaranteed at no point has the minister actually come in here and said, I guarantee that no money was do donated to the Liberal Party on behalf of this protection visa applicant. That's I right. guarantee that. Have you, have you guarantee that? Leader of the Opposition. Well, why not? Uh, Member for Lawler will address her remarks through the chair. Uh, rhetorically, Painful as it may be, you should be having eye contact with the chair, not with the oh. minister. <laughs> 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 uh, Member for Lawler. It, it'll be my pleasure, Mr. Speaker. It'll be my pleasure. Right. Can I say to you rhetorically, Mr. Speaker, if, if, the, if, the case, if the case was that no money had been donated to the Liberal Party on behalf of this protection visa applicant, then you would expect a minister subject to a censure motion to walk in and say that. I mean, right. After all, we've got this censure motion because the government actually thought it was all a good idea at the time. <laughs> well, if it was all a good idea at the time, I know what I would have wanted if I was Minister for Immigration. I would have wanted a file that I could table that completely exculpated me from every allegation made. And I would have been able to want to, would have wanted to walk into here and say, I guarantee 100 per cent no money was donated on behalf of this visa applicant to the Liberal Party. That hasn't happened. And the minister, of course, your guarantee? the minister, of course, guarantee? overnight. It, it, I don't know who's uh, responding next for the government, but perhaps the person <laughs> responding next for the government uh, can, can actually can actually give that guarantee. He might have been at the dinner. Was at the dinner? The, these allegations were raised in this place yesterday, properly, properly, and I resent any implication that they weren't raised properly, because we are entitled, as the opposition in this country, to be assured that the visa allocation system is working properly. Yeah, yeah. We are, we're actually concerned about the integrity of the migration system. We're actually concerned about queue jumping on this side of the House. So on that basis, we raised matters properly going to the integrity of the visa allocation system and queue jumping yesterday. They were related to a Liberal Party fundraiser. The minister involved and the member involved whose fundraiser it was have had overnight to confer. If you were able to 100 per cent rule out the making of a donation, well, rhetorically, Mr Speaker, I ask you, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? And it hasn't been done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I conclude by saying this? We've got a man who, on the third occasion in front of the minister, gets a visa. We know that there was a donation made in between. The two, two, uh, Kate, two uh, issues advanced by the minister don't stack up on a proper examination, and there's been no objective backing of them by tabling the file. Well, if you want to answer this allegation, get the file out and make the guarantee. Otherwise, we are entitled to conclude, and people listening to this debate are entitled to conclude, that there is something here that, Minister, that, something here that smells and should worry them greatly Minister, about the integrity of Australia's migration system. This is the political Minister. party that says we decide to, who comes to this country in the circumstances in which they come. What's the price? Order. Yeah, yeah. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the House, Minister for Employment uh, and Workplace Mr. Relations. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member for, the member, the member for Lawler has said, uh, she has said that uh, uh, the gentleman in question, or somewhere on his behalf, uh, went to a fundraiser, made a $3,000 donation and said, this donation is on behalf of the gentleman in question and he expects a visa. I guarantee that that did not happen. I guarantee that that did not happen. Nothing like that ever happens. Nothing like that ever happens at Liberal Party fundraisers and nothing like that should ever happen at any political party fundraiser. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I can understand, I can understand uh, why the member for Reid did not move this censure motion yesterday. I can understand why the member for Reid uh, was unwilling to move this censure motion today uh, until forced to by the House because, Mr Speaker, the member for Reid is incapable of moving a censure motion. He's incapable of moving a censure motion because he has no evidence, no evidence whatsoever upon which a censure motion 
should be based. Mr. Speaker, I suppose the first point that the member for Reid made uh, was that the gentleman in question uh, should never have been let in. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, he must be the only person who's ever applied to come to Australia who members opposite don't think should have been let in. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite are the people uh, who believe that anyone who gets here should be able to stay here. They're the people who want to see an open door immigration policy being run by Australia. But, Mr. Speaker, the other point that the, the member, member for Wirrawa tried to make tried to make that member you can't Blackstone. have a fundraiser uh, without uh, cash changing hands and ministers watching. That's the, that's the claim uh, that, 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 that members opposite are making, that there is no such thing as a party political fundraiser without scads and scads of cash changing hands, probably not even in brown paper envelopes, and ministers watch all this. And ministers are advised the of exactly for what Swan each bit of warned. cash is for. Well, that is an utterly absurd allegation. It is a contemptible allegation, and it should never be made, never be made without without evidence. Now, Mr. Speaker, um, the next uh, the next claim that is uh, that is clear in the member for Reid's censure motion is that no one ever comes to a fundraiser without seeking corrupt favours. Well, again. This is smearing every single person who has ever been to a party political fundraiser. This idea that it's impossible to go to a fundraiser without seeking a corrupt favour is simply wrong, simply and utterly false, Mr. Speaker. And it demeans this I warn the member and it demeans Reagan. the member for Reid, and most of all, it demeans the leader of the opposition that he should have been party to this pathetic effort. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, members opposite. I have the member for Werriwa for the have, third time have speculated. Um, Mr. I, I have already interrupted the member for Werriwa for his interrupt. Member for Macmillan is warned. Mr. Mr. Speaker, minister has the Mr. Call. Speaker, members opposite have speculated uh, that I may have been the other minister at the fundraiser in question. Mr. Speaker, to put them out of their agony, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to let them to put their minds at ease, I am prepared to say, Mr. Speaker, yes. I was at the fundraiser in question. The fundraiser in question uh, took place uh, sometime uh, not, too, not too long before the last election. Uh, it took place at Romeo's restaurant. Uh, there was about 50 or 60 people there, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't know whether the gentleman in question was there. Uh, and I don't know whether the gentleman who is alleged to be the friend of the gentleman the member for in Watson. question was there. Mr. Speaker, I don't know and the member uh, who made uh, donations. Uh, I don't know uh, whether particular raffles were raised. I don't know whether particular auctions might have taken place. I don't know, and the Minister for Immigration wouldn't know either. I didn't know how much money was raised uh, until I read about it in the newspaper, and the member and, and the Minister for Immigration likewise wouldn't know how much money was raised uh, until uh, he read about it in the newspaper. Mr Speaker, the truth is, as you would know, that Liberal members of parliament are governed by a strict uh, code of conduct, and amongst many other things, the code of conduct says uh, that members of parliament uh, should, should, not, should not solicit uh, donations and should not handle donations. It's a very good code of conduct. And I would commend it to members opposite. I would commend it to members opposite, and I would suggest to members opposite that they should not think that ministers in this government and members of parliament in this coalition act by the same sort of standards, which are obviously only too common, only too common in the Labor Party, a Labor Party which is regularly asking people to spend $1,500 or more uh, to come to dinners to come to dinners so that they might get to know ministers, Mr Speaker. This is an absurd and absurd suggestion that members opposite are trying to make. Now, Mr Speaker, let's again review uh, what the member for Reid uh, has, been, has been saying. Well, uh, he's been saying, he's been saying uh, that the gentleman in question, uh, the visa applicant, uh, was at the fundraiser in question. Uh, well, he's presented no evidence no evidence whatsoever. Uh, he has said that a donation was made uh, by this gentleman or by someone on behalf of this gentleman. No evidence 
has been presented. Uh, no evidence whatsoever. I mean, is there a stat deck anywhere? Is there a stat deck of someone else? Uh, uh, is uh, uh, there, a, there a report anywhere about this? There is no evidence whatsoever. It is just a disgusting, a disgusting and dirty, grubby fishing expedition by a, the member for Reid, who should know better. And then finally, and then finally, and then finally, the member for Reid has alleged that a corrupt decision was made. Well, again, Mr Speaker, not one shred, not one scary, not one scrap of evidence has been produced to justify this grubby, dirty, unworthy, disgusting smear on a good minister. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker let's consider, let's consider uh, the, the censure motion, the censure motion uh, that the member for Reid put before the House. This House, he said, censures the minister for failing to adequately explain to the House the alleged new information that he relied upon to approve the visa application. That is, that is almost embarrassingly weak, Mr Speaker. He has no evidence that the gentleman in question was there. Uh, he has no evidence that the friend of the gentleman in question was there. He has no evidence that a donation was made. He has no evidence that conditions were placed on a donation because uh, no such donation would ever be accepted. And he has no evidence that a corrupt decision was made. So he's reduced to coming into this House and censuring the minister uh, because he's failed to adequately explain himself. Mr Speaker, this is one of the worst and the weakest censure motions that has been moved in this House for a very long time. The member for Reid has fallen into the, fallen into the trap uh, that we laid for him, Mr Speaker, because we on this side knew that there was nothing whatsoever to justify the outrageous smears and the imputations that the member for Reid, egg egged on by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, was making. Uh, Mr Speaker, what in the end is the crime uh, of the Minister for Immigration? Uh, the first crime uh, is that he listens to representations. Well, why shouldn't the Minister for Immigration listen to representations? He's a member of parliament. Why shouldn't he listen uh, to other members of parliament? And let's face it, he gets representations. In this case, he had representations by, amongst other people, the member for Kingsford Smith. Why shouldn't he have listened to those representations? And why shouldn't he have listened to the representations finally made uh, by the bishop in question? The other crime of the Minister for Immigration is that he is close uh, to a community. Well, Mr Speaker, he is the Minister for Immigration. He is the Minister for Multicultural and Ethnic Affairs. Why shouldn't he be close to a community? In fact, it would be a tragedy uh, if a Minister of the Crown in this country was not able to get close uh, to important communities. Now, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, there has been nothing whatsoever done wrong by this minister. More importantly, there has been nothing whatsoever demonstrated by members opposite that this minister has done anything wrong. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, I will, uh, I will, I will say to the House, uh, there has uh, at times been corruption uh, in the administration of the immigration system, and a colleague of members opposite is now in jail. Is now in jail uh, because of that, Mr. Speaker. The former member for Corwell is now in jail uh, because, because of things that, minister, that, that happened but minister, shouldn't happen. Minister, Mr Speaker, the whole point, member for where the I whole point, the whole minister point. has raised an issue that the clerk has reminded me subject to appeal I'm, and therefore I'm, ought not to have been raised. Okay. I, 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 I the certainly, member for, I certainly, I member certainly for Batman not when I'm assisting the debate in the sense of the flow of the debate properly frustrates the role of the chair. Mem the minister has the call I, to be heard I in silence. I certainly, would not I certainly would not wish, Mr. Speaker, uh, to say anything that trespassed on any of the standing orders. But, so, Mr. Speaker, I, I will not continue down that path. But, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that this minister, when he came into office, was determined to clean up the administration yeah. of the immigration yeah. system, and yeah. that is precisely what he has done. I know the minister. Members of this house know the minister, and any members of this house who have dealt with the minister would accept, should accept, if they're prepared to give credit where it's due, that this minister has been probably the most outstanding minister for immigration of recent times. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
Mr. Speaker, as the Minister for Immigration has made abundantly clear, uh, he acted because new representations were made, uh, new evidence and new information was provided. Well, why shouldn't he do precisely what he did on the basis of precisely what has happened in this case? Uh, the position of members opposite appears to be that just because some uh, representations are refused, all representations are refused. And if some representations uh, are refused, any representation that isn't refused is somehow corrupt. It is a pathetic and a hopeless I allegation. For it's well. completely unworthy of members opposite, and it's certainly it's completely unworthy of a leader of the opposition who's pledged to raise standards. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that this is a grubby fishing expedition. Uh, it is clear. Uh, it is clear, Mr. Speaker, uh, that they have no evidence. Uh, in the end, in the end, all they could say was that, well, uh, the Minister for Immigration should have known about something uh, before he finally did know, again, know about something. But, Mr. Speaker, it's not the Minister for Immigration's fault uh, if people uh, who are making representations on behalf of someone uh, don't initially or even subsequently produce all the evidence that they might be able to to justify that case. When they finally did produce the evidence, the minister acted uh, as he should. Then uh, the, uh, the member for Lawler suggested uh, that uh, unless, unless uh, uh, the Minister for Immigration uh, was prepared to produce the file, uh, that would prove that there was a confidential file a confidential file dealing with people's lives, uh, that there would be somehow proof of corruption. Well, the suggestion uh, that every decision that is not justified by the production to a feral opposition of the complete file is just absolutely, utterly and completely absurd. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker it's pretty clear that what we have seen over the last couple of days is an exercise in mudslinging, a sad and unworthy exercise in mudslinging uh, designed uh, to prop up the failing leadership uh, of the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, this is his muscle-up strategy, Mr Speaker. Uh, he tried the member for Lilly. Uh, the member for Lilly, uh, a man of some honour, uh, had some standards that he wouldn't transgress, so he said, OK, OK, let's bring in the member for Werriwa. Let's have a muscle-up strategy, and that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, the words might be the member for Reeds, uh, the words might be the Leader of the Oppositions, but the ideas and the grubby gutter tactics are nothing but the member for Werriwa's, uh, a man who just can't wait to pull his knife out of the, of the sheet and shove it in the of the Leader of the Opposition. The of the Mr Lilly. Speaker, an unworthy Speaker. motion from an unworthy opposition. This is an opposition that knows, doesn't know where it stands, doesn't know where it stands, doesn't know what it believes in. Uh, it's now wracked uh, by a fight to the death between two proven, proven failures. And Mr. Speaker, I move as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting the following words: the House censures the member for Reid for attempting unsuccessfully to conduct a campaign of innuendo, imputation, and smear against the Minister for Immigration and failing to substantiate his claims when compelled to do so by the House. I commend that amendment to the House. The question now is: there was a question of. Member for Batman on a point I think of order. I, I, on a point of order, Mr. Speaker, I thought I heard you requesting that the minister withdraw some unsavoury and uncomplimentary, un-Australian remarks. Yeah, the, the Is the that true, Mr. The Speaker? Member for Batman, resume his seat. The member for Batman. Order, Mem Minister. <laughs> the member for Batman is right that there were words. The member for Batman is right that there were words uttered that I felt. Um, were inappropriate. I didn't require their withdrawal. I drew the minister's attention to the fact that the motion of censure, which does allow a little more latitude than normal, was a motion of censure of the Minister for Immigration, not a motion of censure of either the member for Werra or the member for Lilly, which seemed to me to be reasonably addressing what was an inappropriate remark on his part. The question is, uh, uh, the original question was that the motion be agreed to. This, the Honourable the Leader of the House has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted 
with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words be omitted stand part of the question. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. The clerk, the clerk has just suggested that, for the convenience of the House, I might, I should restate what I have just said. The original question was that the motion be agreed to. To this, the leader of the House has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I just confer the clerk. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells. Standing order still applied during a division. Treasurer, Leader of the Opposition.
lock the doors. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tell us for the noes and the honourable members for Franklin and Melbourne Ports tell us for the ayes. Porter, the result of the division is I 61, no 78. The question is therefore negative. The question now is that the words proposed to be substituted be so substituted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Members would please quickly take their seats. Lock the doors. 
The question is that the words proposed to be substituted be so substituted. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite and Mallee tellers for the eyes, honourable members for Franklin and Melbourne Ports tellers for the nose. The provision is I 78, no 62. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, is the division required? Ring the bells for one minute. I just remind anyone leaving the chamber they should report to the tellers. Lock the doors. The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. This is a one minute division. Point the same tellers as in the previous division.
order. The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 89. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister. The member for we're on a point of order. For I think you'll find this. I think you'll find, Mr Speaker, that the member for Reid is halfway through asking a question in the House. You asked him before the censure motions to reframe his question and put it to the Minister for Immigration. Surely it is inappropriate, surely it is inappropriate to ask for further questions to be placed on the notice paper when the member for Reid hasn't had an opportunity to finish the question. Let me indicate that to the member the for Werriwa that I am absolutely certain that if he rummages through the hand over the weekend, he will find absolutely no exception has been made by this particular decision. And as it is 4.30 pm, I propose the question that the House do now adjourn.